Welcome to It's All Connected, the podcast featuring some of the best coaches and clinicians in the industry, sharing their knowledge and experience on every aspect of health and fitness. Hey there, welcome to my channel. And today's guest of honor with me is Mr. Greg Hawthorne. He's, he's an athletic trainer from Georgia, USA. He is an incredible guy. He has immense knowledge in biomechanics, breathing, training, and Greg, welcome to my channel. How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure, man. So, Greg, I would like to know. So, there's a lot of misconceptions in this industry, like the myths and everything. So, I would like to start with static stretching. So, a lot of people think they're doing great with static stretching, but Mostly, they're not getting what they want through static stretching, but they're doing it for weeks, months, years. Right. Still, they're the same. So if you could elaborate on the role of static stretching and yeah. w- when it is not so useful and when it can be useful. Okay, definitely. So static stretching, again, yeah, it's super common. Why do, why do people do static stretching? One, two reasons usually, because they're told to by yes. someone. They've read something. Three, because it kind of makes them feel good, right? But usually those, those issues with that is they're, they're temporary, right? The feel good is temporary. I got to go stretch again. I got to go stretch again, right? Mm. How many people do we know who have been stretching for years and yes, yes. they're still stretching, right? Mm. And all the whole thing with that is, you know, the definition, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over again, expecting different results. So it's like, you know, you get stuck in this loop of I'm stretching and it feels good. All right, it should work this time. Nope, doesn't work. All right, let's do it again. It should work this time. Nope, doesn't work. And you keep doing that. So, but one, so two reasons, psychologically, you're doing it because you get that dopamine hit of the feel good. Mm -hmm. So like you almost get addicted to it, right? It's almost an addiction to feel good. But the reason why it feels good when you stretch is pretty much you're creating, you're, you're eliciting a sense in those nerves within the, within that tissue, right? So like whatever, like say your hamstrings, right? You're going to stretch your hamstrings. So you stretch them and it, it feels good because why you're, you're actually like putting a, uh sense through it so it's like you're telling the nerves and things like that like we're doing something and and the body likes to do something it doesn't like to be like stagnant yes so you're putting the stretch in through there but the reason why so that's why it feels good so you get a sense the issue why the the big problem is understanding is like why is it not getting much love in general like why are we not getting the sense so most of these stretches that you have like you feel like you're stretching not necessarily the muscle Hmm. but like the muscle is is wrapped in if it, it's it, the muscle that we usually think of as muscles wrapped in like tissues. And that's what you're stretching. That, and that's where the nerves are that you feel the stretch through. And so, so like it, it, to, to get an idea, like if you ever had like a meat or anything like that, that you cooked or got from the, got from the store, um, you know, there's a, the, the thick start, the sinewy stuff, the things you had to cut off that's, that's super chewy uh, in the muscle. That's the stuff we're talking about. Like the red meat or the meat itself isn't necessarily what I'm referring to. That's the muscle, but the encasing is the is the muscle right or, or the, the connective tissue and so we put a stretch through there and that's where we feel the issue is the reason why we're not getting why that, that stretch feels so good and because of that sense we're giving it the issue is the muscle itself is in a position where we don't use that muscle so it's usually a lack of use and so because like i can stretch it by, from the outside right so i can take this and i can do i have my balloons i get some balloons I got some balloons we can talk about. Hold on. Me- yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, get those, get those. Visual demonstrations have right always here. been. Yeah, right here. It's so much easier. So it's like you have your muscle. We'll just say that's your muscle, right? This is, well, inside is the muscle. We'll say in here is the, this is like the connective tissue. That's that uh, tissue stuff. Hmm. So when you stretch, you're doing this, hmm. right? And so I was like, oh, we're going to send, oh, it feels kind of nice. I'm getting this opening. Things feel a little bit looser because I essentially tell my body it's safer to move in that position. You put it there. Oh, I'm in a new position. Hey, I didn't die. We're good. <laughs> I, I can relax. I can go in that position a little bit further. The issue is it's, it's, a, it's a temporary stay. Like we, we can't stay here. This feels good. But then if I relax, we're gonna, we stay back. We fall back to this position. So I can get a stretch like this. Okay. Or I can get a stretch from muscle contracting i get the muscle to contract and fill up with fluids like you ever when you work out you get that pump it's mm-hmm. that blood flow the fluid going into the muscle essentially and so essentially we're stretching it now like that 
Hmm. So now we have this stretch on the tissue from using it. And then when you're working out or when you're doing anything or you have like, if you're in a good position, I should say in general, you know, you have a, I contract and then I relax. And then contract and then relax. Ah. And now I have this constant stretch on these tissues all day long. So now I get this, you know, this expansion of the muscle, this compression of the muscle, the expansion, compression kind of on and off. And it just as those stresses to the tissue. And so that's where you get a good stretch. So that makes it feel good. makes it feel better. And that's more of what's going to lead to longer term change. Now, stretching again, isn't bad. I don't, I let my people stretch. Why? Because it feels good. hundred percent. It feels good. And sometimes being in certain orientations can, uh, so having like your hips long or hamstrings long, they potentially can lead to higher performance results depending on what you're doing. The only issue that comes into that is you have potential, a, a less wiggle room for error. So you have a higher potential, I would say for injury, uh, depending on fatigue. And so you having that stress position, you can use that to, again, help you achieve those positions. So you look at, uh, if we're, and it could be temporary, it could be short-term, depending on what you wanna do, you can stretch, feel good. You can then turn muscles on to get a better position there because it's, it's more neurological at that point that you're getting. So it's useful from that standpoint. At the same time, it gives you a wiggle room essentially to move also. So like, say I am trying to get a better position. I may end up being able to stretch something so it's not as good as firing because research has shown that when you stretch a muscle, you decrease your maximum voluntary contraction. So the inability to make the muscle hard. And so you may want to stretch that muscle in advance if you're trying to essentially work, it's a work, it's work is a nemesis it's an antagonist. So like the front of your thigh. So say I'm trying to stretch my quad or, or loosen up my quad. I may try to stretch that thigh first and then turn the hamstrings on after that. Because now as I, the muscle can't fire as well as it used to because I just stretched it on the quad, but my hamstrings now give it a better chance to do the work that I wanted to do without the hamstring, without the quad taking over. Does that make sense? Hmm. And so the usefulness of the stretch can be from that, or it could just be from, again, just feeling good in general, giving you that sense that you want uh, of feeling good. Um, and, and so that's kind of where I feel like it's useful. If you're trying to change positions, like, so if you're trying to get, you know, less tilt, less uh, forward shoulder posture, you know, people with the anterior desk, desk position, mm -hmm. stretching from there is usually not going to achieve what you want to do. Stretching, I think, is more useful when it comes to athletics. I think that's, that's honestly, or performance-based gains. I think that's where stretching has the best uh, advantage and best use. Mm -hmm. When it comes to general population or like just rehab and feeling good, stretching, I think is the only time you do that is like a, as I mentioned before, shut them up to help decrease the ability for that muscle to do what it's supposed to do with contract mm -hmm. to work the other muscle that you're working with. So if I'm trying to get my hamstring stronger, I may decrease the stretch my quads and then work my hamstrings immediately after and maybe do a super set like that. Uh, makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. Rounded shoulders and all the stuff, that's of people, corporate people who have it. If they want to gain some uh, variability in the system, if they want to, like they, they're this and they want to be this, it's not going to work with stretching. It's going to work with ribcage no. expansion. Correct. You're trying to change my you know, like with the balloon, expand mm. things up and out, right? Mm. The stretching, yeah, sure, it's going to feel good. Mm. It's going to feel good. But again, if I stretch it, it's there, but it comes right back, right? Mm. So if I'm pulling on, I'm stretching a balloon here. And if I let it go, it comes back close to each other. So we get a stretch, but it's going to come back. But that stretch, again, if you ever blew up a balloon, if I stretch it, it's easier to blow up versus mm. cold, right? And so again, doing a stretch prior to working the opposite, filling that space with something else, then you have results, right? So there's not, you can stress to get that feel good, but then make sure you're doing something to maintain that position. Hmm. Yes. Like th there are uh, so many, what to say, uh, tips and tricks, as they say, for corporate people, you work on your desk and after 20 minutes, go out and stretch something, which is okay. But, but the number one thing that needs to be focused on is breathing. How well yes. is your ribcage expanding and compressing? Yes. That's the most important thing. Big facts. And like, again, setting yourself up in positions like at your desk and things like that to bias just your natural basic level breathing without having to focus on it, computer height, seat height, all these mm -hmm. things, hand position, computer position, 
driving different rotations based on your keyboard. Those things kind of help more long term. Again, any one stack posture is going to lead to mm. biases in one way. You know, when we're 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 moving things. Um, again, good or bad. Um, usually as a desk job, usually not good because you know most times we hope we don't live our life there. Yeah. Um, but I generally want to drive like this rotation, like you're saying. And so 100, like you gotta fill it up with something else, right? Get here, just squeeze your shoulders back. Usually that's not gonna that's not it's gonna move something else forward. Like you you're in the same position essentially, but now you're just driving something else in a in a different position, right? You're not really mm. altering. The, that area that's tight it's going to be tight now just in a different spot mm, correct because this is something i want to make clear uh, to all the viewers who are watching this this versus this like both of these positions are just reducing the surface area of your lungs of your thorax as they say you're not getting true expansion of the lungs in both of these positions. So to get a proper front to back expansion of the rib cage, you need to be in a position where you are not squeezing it from the front or from the back. So that is something to keep in mind. So it, very much so the, the solution for this is not this. And the solution for this is not this. Right. It's all about from the inside. So like, I know I mentioned the stretching and, the hamstrings and the, and the muscles, like, you know, doing this thing, but those are all based on your bony positions, essentially. So mm -hmm. like, if I have, I'm gonna bring out a little model here. Yeah. So if I have a hamstring and it's attached to this muscle, this area right here, and it kind of goes to here, mm -hmm. right? I'm gonna try to hold like this, just to put it in the headlock, right? So it's gonna be here. So this is a bone and it attaches mm -hmm. right to here and hamstring kind of goes here. Huh. So if I, if I were to shorten that muscle, so take my hamstring closer to that spot. What's going to happen here is I can't have this looseness. You can see it's loose. It's loose there, right? Mm. So it's kind of floppy. I can't have that. Mm. If I have that, the body, the body is going to have an issue, right? It's going to like the guts are going to fall. I'm really going to fall, right? I can't stand up. I can't. I'm going to something's going to yeah. give because there's nothing holding me here. So in order to fill that position, you get a little contraction there. So now you have the stiffness in that muscle. Right, so now it fills that gap, keeps the tension tight. So if I wanna move from here and I go to stretch, all I'm doing is this, right? It's not letting go. Huh. If I wanna move and like, I need to adjust this bony position, so I need that. So the muscle got tight essentially because these bones got close together, I need to fill that space so the muscle naturally gets tight. So same thing with the shoulder. If I take my shoulder blade, bring it down, the muscle that holds the shoulder blade and that together, that has to get tight. Otherwise, like your, your heart falls out or whatever, right? It just, yes. you, can't, you can't not have that slack in your tissue. So it's gonna fill up to fill yes. that space. Yes. But if I just lean back or drive it back, I'm not necessarily adjusting this position. I may just be going like that with that muscle. Hmm. So technically, if I get in a position, relax, and then the muscle is going to, again, leave air out. So now I have this natural tension that I want in that position. So that's good. Vice versa though, same thing is if I'm in this position, it's hard to blow up a balloon like this, mm. right? It's difficult for me to blow a stretch balloon. If you're having those really long ones, you put really stretch and try to blow into it with that stretch, the tension's a lot higher. Mm. It makes it more difficult. So same thing with the muscle, when it's stretched out, it doesn't have the ability to contract like it needs to. So now, instead of me being able to contract this muscle, if I'm in a long position, so like, let's say I'm sitting at a computer and I, my hips are tilted forward, mm. right? We get to look at the same thing, you know, at chest, I'm, my, my hips are tilted, my, I'm tilted forward here, right? So we'll look on the back side, same thing like in the, in this area, in your rhomboids between your shoulder blades, and I'm tilted forward, they're really stretched out. Now, I need to adjust this position in here, I need to pull that leg back or pull this uh, yeah. bone yeah. closer to it, right? I need to get them closer together, something needs to give. Issue is, I'm so stretched out, I can't do it. And so I'm going to try to do it, but essentially what I'm going to do that is by just rolling everything back and around and creating stress or decreased tension somewhere else where I'm not going to get this point. So I need to, in order to get there, relax another position, get that to drop down. So like, again, if I'm here in this position, that stretch, this muscle now is tight. So I need to have this give and take of, so again, here, I, I'm tight to my shoulder blades. A lot of like, uh, you get a lot of tight backs or like little stiffness in the back, like these little sharp pains in your back. 
And it's because you're here. You can't just go here to shorten mm. it because this muscle is tight. So you need to get to kind of adjust these things. So getting yourself into positions, and this is where the breathing comes into play. If I can get breathe, I'm going to move everything in here. So as I breathe, this is gonna come drop, this is gonna drop, it's gonna create this expansion overall. It's gonna put these muscles in these positions that are better at doing whatever it needs to do. So now it's like in a, like a, a basic position, like we'll say slightly you know, here. So it's not filled with air, it's not tight. It's in a position that can go either way. And so now it has options. And that's where it comes down to the same thing with it. And that's where that breathing comes into play. It's going to set up these muscle positions from the center of the body, essentially hmm. from your spine, because everything connects back to here. Hmm. And so if you get that right from the air and the pressures in your system, that's going to help bias everything else. The issue is if I've been here for so long or if I've been here for so long, I'm going to have the, this is a balloon. It's not a real person, right? So th the, imagine this balloon has the ability to remodel and help itself out, heal itself. If I hold in one position very long, the, this balloon thickness, the tissues are going to get thicker or more stretched out or whatever it is. So they're going to be biased to being in the position that they like to be. And this is why things don't stick overnight. You have to have consistent consistency mm -hmm. to create these changes so you can tell it to let it remodel, let it remodel, let it remodel, let it remodel. Okay, now we're good to go. That's why it takes about six weeks and things like that for things to set because we have to get the connective tissue uh, and the tissues that we're talking about to be model and have those nerves now, as I mentioned before, the nerves are in this tissue to be able to build and make those connections because either they're too far away because they're too stretched out, if you will, or there's too much stuff in between them to create a good connection so that we have the right muscle feel that you want. So you don't have to stretch it all the time. Hmm. This is, this is uh, pretty crucial. And also there's diagnosis like, oh, your this muscle is very weak. And that is why you're having this issue. But we have to think that out of everything, why did, why did that particular muscle decided to be weak? Right. And that's that, and that's that positional place. That's where you sit down like this for so long. Oh, you have weak, you got weak rhomboids. You got to, you know, eyes wide tees, mm -hmm. or you got to stand up straight. Let's put that posture shirt on, or one of those little braces. Let's put that on. You're not one. You're not training a muscle if you do that, right? Because you get assistance if you have the shirts on. Two, it can't. It's only weak because it's leverage. It's like if I'm a muscle and I have this, this rib or whatever pulling me in the middle. How am I going to contract? Like, how am I going to get stronger? If I move out of the way, oh, I'm good to go, mm. right? It's just like these muscles on your back, you have these ribs, you have these things, and you're just literally stretching it across it. It can't, it can't come together. You create that space. Oh, now I can, now I can work just fine, just from a repositioning, just from the breathing. Mm. It, very crucial. Airflow determines, like, how you're going to move. So that is something very crucial because people need to understand that when you're doing this, this, you're not doing opposite motion. You're just orienting the entire rib cage this way or that way. So just because you have tight packs here does not mean if you do this, it will be lengthened. It does not happen that way. You're just mm -hmm. taking the entire rib cage and just flipping, flipping it backward. Yep. It does not change much. Mm -hmm. That's the most and important. It and if people say, oh, well, well, why can I get there? Why can I, why does it feel good or whatever it is when I do there? It's that stretch. But at the same time, understand that, you know, this isn't just this. Hmm. This is connected all the way through. So yeah, I may do this. I'm getting this. I'm getting a stretch down here. Hmm. That's going to, it's a system. So now it's, it's going to decrease the feeling I have way up here because I stretched everything out. It's loose. Hmm. Like all this, like, like the talk to people explain that is like, take your shirt and just pull on it. Where do you feel? Do you feel where it's tight and where you're pulling? No, you feel it up here, mm. right? And so it's like, you're going to understand like that area is going to affect everything else. Like you twist, you see your belly button does little twists and things like that. It's showing that just because I move my arm, you know, my belly button's moving. Like it's just, that's showing that everything's connected. So when you stretch, you, you're most likely, if you're just doing these big overstretch, you're most likely not stretching the area mm. that you actually are trying to affect, mm. right? And if you are, odds are you're just creating this tissue, this, this neural uh, adaptation of saying, hey, we're okay being here. And so it doesn't feel as bad.
Exactly. This, yep. So that's a lot, of, a lot of injuries happen from overstretching. So, yes, that's a big thing for me, especially shoulders and, and knees. <laughs> ah, yeah, true. And, you know, we talked a lot about muscles. So in fitness world, it's like, oh, muscle strengthening. And you have to like, this is tight muscle. This is weak muscle. This is short muscle. This is strong muscle. Everything is like muscle, muscle, muscle. But the most overlooked thing when it comes to movement is the organs here, the guts. They're the most overlooked things. And no one talks about it. So if you could go over the role of guts in movement, that would be very helpful because it would be something like the light bulb moment, aha moment for the viewers. Well, maybe. I mean, can you lead me a little bit? That's a big question. Uh, can you pardon? lead me a little bit more? Like, that's a big question. So like for me, I look okay. at that as... Okay, okay. Let, let me bring some context to it. Thank you. So... How does breathing affect gut movement? First of all, we need to learn that, yes, air is coming in, but how do the organs move when we breathe in? And when we move, why, why it is so crucial for the guts to move, like to alternate, reciprocate when we walk, run, whatever we do on both sides, why is it so important? And why stagnancy can be very detrimental? That is also yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So that's a big question, right? So we'll, we'll start from the beginning. So yeah. understand, as I mentioned before, when I talk about the muscle, same idea, the, the body doesn't like space, Like, right? So if I relax and I've shortened a muscle, it doesn't get slack, right? Because I would dislocate something, right? Mm -hmm. I, if I shorten my bicep or something like that, I would, and I, and I relax it, like just sat down and the muscle stopped doing its job, my joint would fall out of place, right? I would, it, would, mm -hmm. it would dislocate. So overall, there always needs to be a constant tension. The reason for that is, is a sense, right? We have these constant tensions to tell us where our body is in space. The organs play a big role in that, especially when it comes to creating these tensions. So I say all that, so the fact is like, we're, we are, there is no extra space in your belly. Like it is jam packed full of stuff, you know? All your organs, it is smushed in there. Like if you've never gone to a butcher and see that, I recommend just seeing how tight these bellies are, how much stuff is inside, uh, inside us or inside an animal. You can Google pictures, but you'll see there's nothing there. But what we have is the diaphragm. So we have a diaphragm, which what we use to breathe. So it's what you have on your shirt, right? I'm just, that's what that is, correct? Yes. Yeah. Th this is my part. logo. Yep. There you go. Feel, yeah, feel, that's his logo. Fill the organs up from underneath there. Underneath that diaphragm, we also have our pelvic floor, what some people call the pelvic diaphragm, other muscles that hold them up. So, you know, we just don't, our guts just don't come out from underneath us. Hmm. And so we have this constant, we have that in there. So when we breathe in, our diaphragm essentially pushes down. So pushes down on those guts. And what that does, it increases pressure inside your stomach or inside the abdominal area, decreases pressure up here. This decrease in pressure allows air to go into your lungs. So it's not like the airs are, the lungs don't contract hmm. per se, right? They're not like a muscle doing this. It's the diaphragm that creates this pressure change. So then that decrease in pressure in up here allows the air to come in. And then that air kind of comes until the pressure essentially balanced. I should say close to balance, you know, so you have these pressures where it goes into the point where it can get the same thing. Hmm. And so then we breathe out and we get a compelled before contraction. We relax the diaphragm. The organs now push back on our diaphragm raise it back up, pushes the air out of our, out of our, out of our lungs. So then we can have this constant exchange. So it's all about in and out, in and out, in and out. Now our organs themselves, I'm pretty sure all this is theory ish here. I believe all tissues have some form of contractility, right? Mm. I don't think, you know, the organs have some, but they're, they're not great, right? There's, there's, there's probably not a ton of contractility. And so what the breathing does from a health standpoint in general is it massages your organs, all right? If you're tight and you feel something like it's stiff and it's, and it's really like, you know, like your shoulders here, you rub it, right? It feels good. You know, it kind of loosens things up, moves things around. Well, your breathing does that to your organs. So as you breathe in, it pushes them. As you breathe out, it comes back. So it's this constant massage of the organs. This is going to help increase your digestion, increase kind of fluid flow through everything, help with... Uh, you know, stomach emptying contents is going to help with blood flow to all the air, all the stuff down there. The issue can come into play is if I'm in a bad position, mm. I may be biasing on this one area. So uh. you'll see people walk around and they'll have like a, like a pooch belly potentially. 
Um, so yeah, so either low or high, or like someone that opened up here and have a, a big gut here. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing now is essentially we're taking the organs and we're just pushing them in that direction mm -hmm. constantly. So now you have like the organs on the backside, on the front side, getting constantly smashed by the, by the, by the bony stuff and the diaphragm. And you have this other anterior aspect of it getting pushed into your abs. And so they, they don't have as much pressure. So you have this bias now of kind of more fluid stuff, more things in front, less in back. So this would be the organs themselves, as well as the contents kind of having this poor flow. Things won't go so well to the back, maybe go too fast in the front. So you have this general positioning thing from a health standpoint that these organs play with the diaphragm. So that's going to matter. At the same time now, from a performance standpoint, walking, things like that, these organs help force things in other ways. So if I'm walking, we always, like we don't ever empty our body of air, mm. right? We always have to have some kind of air in our system. Otherwise, like, I think you die. We'd um, collapse. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So we always have some form of air in our system. And so, and, and we also need this tension. So essentially what we're doing is if I'm having the organ, so we'll say, we, if we look at, uh, look, we look at your shirt and we look at the, the, the diaphragm position, he has a setup where you can see there's an asymmetry, right? One size higher than the other side. So that's going to adjust how things go. So essentially what we're looking at is as I push down on one side, the, uh, that side is gonna go deeper. And if I have another side relaxed, it's gonna go the other way. So essentially I'm squeezing the balloon example, let's go a little higher. I have this balloon and like I squeeze down here, I'm gonna push the organs over to that side. So mm. I'm here, I'm gonna contract over here. So I'll push the organs here as that compresses. So what does that do? That creates a little bit more tension. That creates tension in these tissues we talk about, assisting movement, um, letting you get into other positions, adjusting how that rib cage or how the uh, hips are going to position themselves. And it's gonna affect your interaction with the ground. And then we have a contraction back on the other side. So we're constantly breathing when we're walking or doing something when we're reaching. We're not trying to, through our life, we have this constant inhale, exhale. But what we have are these tensions and these relaxations, these pushing of one side and the expanding of the other side and back and forth. So these, the organs essentially drive one of the pressures that we feel within our bodies to create tensions where we need them and to, again, when we move it around, to create tensions where we uh, decrease tension where we don't, right? Mm -hmm. Where we're trying to have relaxation. The issue is when you get stuck in one position or you have these positions, then you have tension in one area all the time and you can't go side to side, side to side, right? And that's where we have issues. And when we have those issues, one, movement, movement issues come into play, mm. right? So I have, I start biasing certain muscles more, I start buying certain tissues more, I start feeling tight in certain areas, I start feeling weak in certain areas. But, you know, deeper than that, I feel like then we start having more concerns about what's going on internally. We start having mm. issues with like, you know, a lot of the chronic diseases, you know, most likely are due from, hey, look, I'm constantly having pressure on this one area. I'm constantly having this tension on this one area. So like I said, I get bad at blood flow to that area. Yes. I get bad at cell uh, turnover in that area. I get bad at diffusion in that area. So I have all these areas because the pressure is the gradient is poor. And so I never have this influx of in and out. At the other end, I may have, and that's, that's going to be on the tight end as well on the loose end, because if it's too expanded, you uh, know, I'm, if we have this thing, things aren't going to go in and out. And so depending on where you are in life, what you're doing, I believe a lot of this poor breathing, this poor diaphragmatic position, these poor postures, I want to say posture, just the inability to, change to as I mentioned before, this yeah. uh, from the beginning, expand and compress like the muscle, expand and compress the area, this lack of reciprocation, this lack of alternation, whatever you want to call it, um, leads to these chronic diseases. And so it's like, if you can't, if my body is, has a hard time, as I mentioned before, I don't like space, feeling a space. So there's constant, it's going to put something there, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to have bony growth. We're going to have, uh, you know, cell, crazy cells. I, like, I think cancer actually kind of comes into this part, right? Mm -hmm. um, or vice versa, trying to create a space. But we have these things where we start throwing these extra growths as we're trying to fill these gaps. And then that leads to chronic diseases that we don't know about, right? Or having issues with things that we don't sure because it's either I can't fill a space because I've, too, I've stretched it out too far or I can't create space. And so I'm trying to create space in another area or there's more of a blood flow shutting things down and we get necrosis and things start to die. We start getting clots. We start getting, um, you know, uh, like 
blood flow issues, anything that didn't mm-hmm. want blood flow, chronic, but chronic pain a lot of times is the ischemic condition of, you know, decreased blood flow. So like abdominal pain, things like that. Um, we start having poor motility. Uh, mm. So the food doesn't process us very well. We start getting gut issues. We start having allergies all of a sudden. Mm. Um, we start, uh, you know, getting you know, just, just, I can't even imagine, like there's a bunch of health stuff. I really so feel like- So many stuff, yeah, like, like pelvic right? floor issues, pelvic floor issues, uh, yeah. in, incontinence, erectile dysfunction. 100%. Yeah. Uh, hernia, like organs are literally pushing. Mm-hmm. Literally pushing. You will see people who are ribbed, like six pack, eight packs, yet have a bulging belly. Why? It's not adipose tissue. It's not fat. It's, no, it's organs literally pushing. You, yeah. And what happens? They're like pushing front and down. Like they cannot get a good exhalation where the organs can ascend, come up. And you see with people who are middle, this this even the young people have it. But usually you'll see with middle age people, old age people, if they sit for a long time on the ground or on the chair, and when they have to get up, it takes time. And then they have to get up. Why? Because the organs have the inability to come up and then they have to use the entire body force things, which would have been very a fluid movement, but it's mm-hmm. not a fluid movement anymore. They have to, to get their way up. Without a doubt. Yeah. They, they got to put force into the ground some way. Right. Yeah. And so I say, how I look at that is like with that phrase itself is like when we breathe in, like if we look at the, everything here as my diaphragm drops, if we look at where it attaches kind of to the ribs, hmm. it's going to drop down. It's going to lift everything up. Hmm. All right. So as I lift up, it's like, I can't put force into the ground as I'm breathing in. I'm, hmm. I'm kind of lifting up. The guts are going down. We're going to, we're going to go with our guts essentially hmm. where our guts go. That's where we're going to leave. So if they're forward, they're going to, I'm going to be falling forward. If they're back, hmm. I'm going to be falling backwards. Right. If they're, you know, depending on how height they are down and forward, straight forward, down and back, whatever. Um, so we have that, movement so like if i can't raise my guts up with that exhale aka if i'm exhaling if we look at a pelvic floor it's going to essentially grab use the legs to spring itself up which is going to push the legs down to the ground right open things up it's going to slingshot things up and i can't do that i have to use my arms essentially to push down here what this does is create a fake tension through the tissue right so i push here i kind of pull everything up that kind of almost acts like a trampoline. Hmm. So as I get there, now I'm putting into the ground because of this versus a contraction. So I, that connective tissue because versus a contraction and I get this little stretch and it creates that force needed hmm. to stand up. And this is why like people pee when they jump or something like that. It's yeah. the, I'm going to jump and I go to contract. I get, I use this, the spring aspect rather than the muscle aspect to, or the connective tissue to lift myself up. So then it's like, you have this cheat to get up and then Shoulders are up, you know, turn everything in, these position here, shoulder pain, elbows are in poor position, and you never kind of work those legs or the hips, and then your knees start to hurt because you're not utilizing the hips, you know, you're just trying to find any possible way to get up, and you're not, and then you use them over and over and over and over and over again, because you have no options, because Mm -hmm. you're not moving this pelvic floor at all. Yeah, huge, huge, huge. So, you know, when it comes to pain a lot of people say a lot of things but i would like to know your definition of pain and the biopsychosocio model of pain so because pain is pretty multifactorial and it's it's pretty deep but what's your experience and what does your uh, knowledge say yeah so 100 so i said biopsychosocial um do i need to go and explain what that is or yes you... uh, o- overview yeah for sure okay. So like biopsychosocial uh, essentially is we're looking at things are multifactorial, right? Mm-hmm. So it's n- there's never just one thing. And so from a biopsychosocial point, we look at biology. So like us, right? Our bodies, the physical aspect of it, the physiology of it. So like our muscles, our bones, those things, they have pain, uh, you know, same, you know, I guess our nerves kind of fall into that. And you have the psycho aspect and that's where it comes down to like your brain, how you perceive things. So your perception of what is going on, um, and how you sense it essentially like i look at that as a good thing i look at it as a bad thing i look at it as oh it's debilitating i look at that as like hey it's a, it's a barrier to get over um and then there's a social aspect of things which is essentially your environment i'm just going to put it out there and generally your environment so how your environment is affecting you in general and that can then they all feed on each other so it's not like they're separate you could you know if you have like a venn diagram and just put them on top of each other like I, it's like it'll be like a venn diagram i guess where like pain was in the middle if you will i see that yeah. all the time Oh, but then you also not have to drive 
you know, two-way arrows to each one across each other and things like that, because they're all going to influence how we're feeling. So when it comes down to pain, you can approach it in so many ways, right? You have people who are, you know, desensitized to pain. They can deal with a lot. You have other people who are super sensitive to pain and like they can't deal with anything. And everybody's case is real, right? For me, I don't look at it as like, oh, that person's soft. It's like that person has a high sensitivity to pain. And I started thinking, why? You know, why do they have such a high sensitivity to pain? And it could be, again, because of they have essentially stressors Hmm. from all three of those aspects, but from multiple aspects within each aspect, right? So we could say they have tissue quality that's poor. So maybe they are from a bio standpoint, they're in a bad position. Okay. So they have their sports shoulder position and they've been there for a very long period of time. So now we have a posture position that's driving a certain decrease in blood flow. But then we also have potentially a thickening of tissue in that area, which even now decreases more blood flow. So now we have like two aspects from the bio side of things. And then we can look at the cycle side of things and we can look at, you know, there, they see their certain situation as like, I tried all this stuff. It's not working. I'm Uh stuck here. What was me? And so now they're in their head where it's like, I'm stuck here. It's just how I am. I'm dealing with it. And it's like, but it sucks. I'm not happy about it. This is, this is a problem for me. I'm constantly dealing with this. This is going to lead to, you know, neurological changes within your system itself. So the position I'm in is going to drive what we consider a sympathetic. So like a fight and flight uh, thing we're looking at sympathetic system into an overdrive. Then I start thinking about how shitty my life is or how bad I'm doing. And now get even further in there. What this does is increases heart rate, increases, uh, you know, increase, so decreases stroke volume. So you have less blood flowing through higher pressures overall. So you're going to have a less profusion, essentially of blood throughout the system, which is going to lead to, um, you know, less digestion issues because we're, we're kicking off digestion. Now we're trying to survive. So a lot higher activity. So we have all that going on. And then you say they're isolated, right? Because of this potentially woe is me attitude, they're constantly playing, they're constantly complaining about mm. things. Now they're in a situation where they don't have any friends, right? They don't, they don't hang out with anybody too. They may be in a society where, you know, certain things are frowned upon that they enjoy. So now from a social standpoint, they're getting this bombardment of just constant stress of who they are. They may have a job where they have to be in this position that drives things. So they, these are like, for me, the social aspect of things going on. So then we have all these aspects going on and the pain threshold is felt based on everything, like, you know, in your brain. So then it's like, you have your brain and it's understanding that I have all these stressors, all this life, all this thing, it hurts, everything hurts. So when I touch an area that may have increased bio changes hmm. or like have an error, all of a sudden it's painful, right? Because of all these other things in this area, then it just, everything's on overload. So the stress in your head is on overload. So it's going to be hypersensitive to everything from a treatment standpoint, you know, depending on where you lie within your scope practice, what you're seeing you can address the pain through psychological aspects, you know, getting them to understand, hey, look, we are, you know, there's, there's a window, we can, we can survive, we, we're going to get through this, you know, essentially just hyping them up. Uh, two, they find a friend, all of a sudden start laughing and enjoying themselves, right? And they start, you know, they, they, or they switch jobs. So now they have a better job, they're happier there, they switch positions. All these things are now going to affect the nervous system hmm. and essentially move them towards the parasympathetic nervous system or kind of biasing that in regards to rest and digest, relaxing, exhaling, getting this flow moving, uh, the, the, the lungs moving more, posture changing more, that's going to lead to increased blood flow in that area. That's going to lead to potential posture changes. That's going to lead to, you know, it's just leave the pain going away if we unravel that onion. At the same time, getting someone in a better position and posture can do the exact the same thing just in the other direction. I get there, I create increased breathing to a certain extent, increase the blood flow, increase this position, also, I have this blood flow. Now I start de- down, down regulating that parasympathetic system. The pain is a little less. So now I start to, or start down regulating the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so I increase the parasympathetic nervous system. So I get better breathing. <sighs> this doing so now decreases the tension on that area, increases that area there, increases blood flow. So now it's less painful. Because it's less painful, I start seeing, oh, wow, there's, there's a hope. You know? So mm-hmm. now I get hope just from that. And then from there, it's like, oh, you're not as crabby anymore. All of a sudden, you got friends. Now, oh, sudden, now you're breathing, you're relaxed. Now you have these highs and you have these lows in your life, which is essentially the ability to inhale and exhale, right? It's the ability to drive these changes. So now your pain is much less. Hmm. Each one is going to have a different biases. If you have a tear, right? So I tore something or you got shot, right? Or stabbed. 
that bio aspect is super high, yeah. right? Obviously, you have something going on, free nerving, it's going to hurt, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's not the case. But you have people who get stabbed in their leg and they don't feel it, right? You have people who have no leg. They have been mm-hmm. amputated and it itches and there's pain there, right? And so this is, I just say that to understand that pain is 100% in your head, right? It, it's a nerve thing. It's not anything else. It's a pressure, feel, sense going on. And depending on how high that pressure is overall, be it in here or be it directly in that area, be it in your head or directly in the area, that's how the pain is going to be pressure, uh, essentially going to feel. So can you decrease that pressure, decrease that stress on the area? And one of the areas that are being affected, you're going to decrease the pain. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I know it's a little bit, maybe a different answer. No, no, but no. It is exactly what I needed. So it's yeah. like, so n equals to an individual case like some people have so let, let me give an example like i punch this wall with a certain force and i feel nothing someone else with the same force would be like oh my god it's paining it's so hard so like every individual is so different when it comes to pain very much so and, and, and in life and life guys that and life, right. yes, your life, yes. Your life is what kind of dictates that. And, and you can have increased stressors that increase that sensitization. Like you could punch that wall once, right? And it doesn't hurt. Mm. Say you did a, hun- a thousand times. Oh, then it hurts. By time yeah. you, then you go punch the same pressure. Guess what? It hurts now, mm. right? Because of the, and that oh, may yes. have happened in the day, right? Because now you have, you've increased that pressure. You increase the area, the swelling, the, the uh, you know, less surface area, potentially all these other things. Now you have pain, right? And the same thing goes in here, right? If you have this constant, pressure on your head you have this constant bombardment you're thinking about the same thing over and over and over you lose in the same you know cortex change you're going through you know cerebellum you run through all these things constantly in the same area there's an increase in pressure in that area constantly constantly all of a sudden pain starts hurting you mm. start having issues you start having pain in whatever way you want to look at it be it headaches be it anger be it whatever it is all that is pain all that is pressure and we're just trying to feel that but that may be seen felt in here because you start thinking about this correlates with something else. And then now the pain goes into here because it's just that you link it up essentially. Mm. And that's a little bit of a heady, you know, uh, out there answer. But when it comes to looking at things, I really think just again, the pressure, the idea of pressure and this stresses and you can just relieve it somewhere. That's why, again, this goes back to stretching. That's why stretching feels good for a little bit because you just mm. relieve that pressure just a little bit. Yeah. So can you go over the definitions of, relative motion versus orientation and when we are addressing pain why we focus so much on relative motion so if you could go over that yeah so we if we talk about um so going back to like we talk about stretching on the muscles and mm. and the moving so essentially relative motion is going to be if we break down individual joints so like i have we'll use my finger mm. all right i have a joint here i have a joint there i have three joints kind of or two joints in my finger three bones Hmm. So relative motion would be my ability to fold up each of those joints to their full ability, hmm. right? I need to get my finger from here to here. Hmm. I can fold there, 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 and they come down there. Now I can also say, oh, I don't have a lot of motion in here. So I need to get it down. So essentially I can just fold everything down and just kind of squeeze it through and have this general motion. Same idea is like, I can have my hand, just be a little more visual and I could turn it in through here, or I can turn it in Mm. through here, right? Mm. So what I have from a relative standpoint, I have my wrist moving, I have my forearm moving, I have my arm moving, I have my shoulder moving. Relatively, they all move separate from each other. Mm. Orienting my arm in would just be turning my shoulder. Now everything's in, but these, the wrist, the elbow, the arm never moves, just the shoulder, right? So what that does is as I move through more, motion through different joints Hmm. i'm utilizing more tissue i'm expanding i'm distributing forces more so now it's like i'm using a little bit here a little bit here a little bit here a little bit here to get all the way around right even if you look at my arm from here look at my shoulder to here you see how much i went the same spot but you see how much motion hurt so where do you think i'm gonna get pain at if i constantly have to do this Hmm. versus this i'm gonna get it where i'm utilizing the stress too much and so orientation, essentially, it increases the speed of movement potentially because I'm moving things as a unit. It may actually make things longer depending on how I'm doing, 
but the force distribution is much less when I orient. Hmm. So the orientation essentially in, increases the rate of force I'm feeling on a certain tissue at that end point, where a relative motion, so if you, even if you have the pelvis, yeah. like the yeah. relative motion is going to help distribute forces. So like if I have, like when we talk about anterior tilt, I think commonly we see. Yes. And so yeah. like if I'm in a nutated position, so I'm in a position where these guys, they move forward, right? If I do that, that's good. I want it to be able to do this. But what's going is I'm getting motion between these two bones, right? The sacrum, that base here, and the, and the nominates, which are like the wings here, they're moving relative to each other, right? So what does that do? I'm, as we mentioned down here, like I'm getting the tissue changes. I'm getting the stretching through all of that as I, as I move, you know? We could take the same thing, put up in the shoulder, and we could look at this as a shoulder, your shoulder blade, and it's like your ribs would be kind of uh, the sacrum here. And as I move my ribs, my shoulder blades are going to move, mm -hmm. right? And so that allows me to move motion. But if I don't move my ribs or my pelvis here and I need to go forward, so anterior tilt, this is an anterior tilt, this is a, or you could call it whatever. This is a good position, right? Or I can orient mm -hmm. everything forward. So I'm taking this point here and I'm moving it down, good thing, or I'm moving it down, maybe not the best option, hmm. right? And so I have to move that down. Now, if I move that down here, I'm not getting any motion in there. So all these muscles, they just stay as they are, but I'm creating a stretch now through here, hmm. right? I'm creating this, this stretch, this, this feeling of tightness through here because I'm overstretching it. Because that's the only place I get, if I can get some motion here, I can get that. Same idea, if I need to go this way or that way, you know, you can orient any way depending on what you have. And that's the same idea of relative motion is going to help spread the forces out, give you more options, increase blood flow, uh, increase essentially that stretch, that open and closing stretch within the tissue naturally, where uh, orientation is just going to essentially bias one tissue getting worked over and over again to uh, increase the rate of force. So if I hit something, it's gonna, you're gonna feel it really quick. So you get the jolt in your back when you step or something like that. It's because you don't have the ability to move through your hips, right? Same thing, like if we take it up top to the shoulder, if I'm here, if I'm going to reach, it's constantly pinch, pinch, mm. pinch versus the shoulder blade gonna come up and over. We have all these motions through our arm. And so we just start biasing these things. And essentially relative motion is going to be a better way to distribute forces, increase blood flow and increase movement. Um, overall, than this orientation because you run out of space much faster when you orient. Absolutely, people need to understand what's going on. Uh, relative motion versus orientation. So when we in when when in pain, our goal is to distribute the stress throughout the body so that one place does not get all the load, and that is why we focus on breathing. We focus on relative motion so that the stress is distributed and so that you do not feel that pressure, that load on certain parts of the body, which mm -hmm. is giving you pain sensation. 100. Yep. That's what it is. You, you should help that out. It feels better. Then you can do it yourself, right? Poke yes. your finger, push yourself hard, take your whole hand, push yourself hard. One feels a lot worse than the other. Hmm. Now it is force distribution. Greg, the, the, there's a lot of misconceptions as well regarding core strengthening in back pain. Like you say cold? Core strengthening in back pain. Like core, okay. strengthening, strengthening, yeah. strengthening your core. Like yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the solution to back pain. Uh, it's not, it's pretty vague and doesn't, does not have context to it. So if you go, right. go over that. Right, so like again, yeah. So general core strengthening, like, yeah. I, I call, when I work with kids, I call it core strengthening, what I do, right? Mm. Um, just because they know that it's, you know, I, I, as they, I try, I try to mature them out of it eventually. Um, but having that full conversation, that's what they hear. If they, if, anyways, so core strengthening, uh, yeah, I mean, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Right. You, you need to strengthen your core. Um, if you, if you have breathing issues, so like say we have poor postures and our diaphragm is stuck in position, odds are you're going to strengthen your core, right? Whatever that general term, you're going to be strengthening these area through here. Right. But the issue is it's, a blanket statement of like, say it's context. Where are we trying to strengthen? And, and, and it's, and when I say strengthen, you know, it's just more of a, 
control, right? The core mm -hmm. muscles control and manage pressures that, you, that we talked about at the beginning, right? If I'm too tight, it's going to make pressure ramp up quick. If it's too loose, it's going to, be, it's going to struggle to create pressure overall. The connective tissue is going to play into that. But essentially, at the same time, all of our core muscles attach essentially to our pelvis and our ribcage, mm -hmm. right? So they're going to bias certain positions. So you may have certain muscles within your core that you want to bias into a, a better position, right? As you mentioned before, we talked from the beginning, into a better position. So if I'm trying to make my ribcage wider, make my ribcage lower to, again, push things around. If you think about as we're breathing in, you know, I'm pushing things down. When I breathe in, getting the ribcage wider on the front side, I'm squeezing them up as I exhale, letting them come up and on, the in, on the inside. And so these muscles are going to bias how that works. At the same time, at the pelvis, the muscles are going to attach here and they're going to let things drop or let things come up, one or the other, depending on what we're trying to occur. So when it comes to core strengthening, we don't want to just do anti-extension. It's more about the ability to fluctuate between like a compression, a, a strengthening and a relaxing and letting it expand or stretch under pressure. So then it can come back, right? Because this has energy, right? It springs, your abs and things like that should do the same thing. I should breathe in and as I relax, it's almost as constant. Like I get a stretch in them as I breathe in naturally. And then as I, as I kind of stop that inhale, the abs are gonna push it back and create a recoil driving that pressure change overall. The issue is if we do too much core, too much, like especially crunches and things like that, you get the six pack muscle, mm -hmm. but that's gonna essentially crush you down, right? That's gonna pull these things closer. They're not, they're gonna push the guts out to those size areas. So you have, mm -hmm. again, more of a pooch, you're going to mm. tuck things underneath because that doesn't attach of all the muscles that actually doesn't attach too much here. Yeah. You're going to attach to here and then a little thing up here. And all it's going to do is this. You're going to mm. orient a lot more from that. Now, yes, there are two abs. There are two rectus. So you have one on either side and you can. It's just hard. Uh, biasing one up, one down type deal. But that's more rotational work. That's not these sit-ups that people always do. Mm. That's not necessarily just holding in place and doing all these things. And so when we talk about core musculature, you want to bias more the deeper muscles in their ability to stretch and contract wholly. Not just one area, not this area. It's more of controlling that pressure you build up when you breathe in and when you breathe out. So if you're doing core or anything like that, make sure you're breathing exactly. and a good position. That's literally what it comes down to. So when I'm working with the kids, everything's, you gotta breathe. You know, I don't care, you're holding it. You know, we're doing a plank, whatever it is, breathe. You have to breathe. and. And you got a whole position. So we're not breathing like this, mm. right? You got a whole, you know, and it may be fast, but as long as I don't see too much net going on, eventually mm. that slows down. True. They finally get it. They, you know, if I did deload, whatever it is, but, and from there, we're creating these pressures, these changes internally where we want. And so like, if I'm doing another core activity, we see like constantly, you see like the bird dog. So all four hands and knees and reach one leg, reach one arm. Those aren't bad to do either, as long as we're maintaining that core position. We don't want to be going back and forth like this. Yeah, sure, I'm sitting here, my shoulder blades are touching each other. I can hold that position. And like, I'm doing core. Not really. You're hanging mm -hmm. on tissues, right? We're just stretching things out. We're probably doing the exact opposite. What we do is turn those muscles on, but then as I lift one arm and lift one leg, I'm getting things to maintain that position. So as we talked about before, where I'm pushing stuff mm -hmm. into one side, so now pushing stuff to one side, that has to stretch out. So I have to control that ability. I can't just stay tight. Mm -hmm. I got to give just a little bit and it's going to come back. Give just a little bit, it's going to come back. So we want to work in this sense, that feeling, that stretch feeling internally from the abs, from in the back, wherever we are, and it's getting better control. So it's more of a management thing, but you, you can increase strength doing that, right? So yeah, you're trying to increase strength. If, I'm, if someone's walking around like this or even like this, right? Usually we're biasing either the rectus, so the six pack muscles or the, the back muscles that run right up your back, right? So if you have that line up the middle of your back, those can be pretty strong pushing you forward or the, or the six pack can be strong pulling you back. Where everything in between is just kind of stretched out because we're just squeezing the guts, right? We mentioned before into those spots where we're closing up that middle part and everything's coming out to the side. We're getting nice and wide and we don't necessarily want that. Mm, true. Does that make sense? So like, yeah, it's so like core training, not bad. But how you do it. Understand what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Like it's, plank, it's really during playing, people are mm -hmm. at breath holding as, breath as, as you if, can. Yeah. As if they're lifting their one rep max and something. Mm -hmm. But it would be much better if you could get 
100 percent right sure there's a time and place for that super hard maximal contraction the rkc control the, you know the but that's if you're trying to accomplish certain tasks right and generally most most people aren't don't need that you know, if you're a power lifter or you're like a, a Olympic lifter or a, an athlete that requires these brief seconds of maximal tension, so you stop all movement. So we have this hard recoil, hard transfer of energy. Yeah, that's good. But understand, that's also not super long. We're not trying to hold that mm. for 60 seconds. It's a short rep because it's just about turning it and then relaxing because there's always that relaxing content, you know, aspect of it in order to actually see the movement we created, right? Mm. We can't move if we're fully contracted. Yes. If, we're, if I contract, I can't go anywhere. But if I contract really fast and relax, I create this nice energy flow, right? Hitting baseballs, everything. I can't just hit the ball and stop my bat, right? It's gonna, it's gonna, it's not gonna go very far. But if I swing or say cricket, right? If I swing and I hit it, I'm gonna have this point where we hit together mm. and then I have to finish through. Yes. Well, right? It's not just a hard stop. It's a hard hit. Look, if I'm not hard enough, I have a give. If I'm, there is no too hard, I would say, otherwise, unless you beat it, but like you have to go all the way through. But if I stay too stiff, I should say, it's going to be slow yeah. and I can't have it slow because it's, it's a combination of force and movement. Velocity, yeah. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the utility of foam rollers. I think it's kind of like static, static stretching where you feel yep. great, but uh, you've been doing it for over and over and over again, but still insanity expecting some great result. 100%. Right. So same idea. It's, it's, as in, if I do this, that feels mm. good. So like a foam roller is essentially adding pressure. Mm. It's distributing, moving things around, right? If I take a, a water bag and I push on it, right? You're going to see the water go away from the bag. And so if we look at, again, the same idea of like my muscles, as I can track, I drive blood flow to it. So I push on it. I'm going to kind of move things around those areas. I'm going to have less tension on those areas. So I'll move some fluid around. But again, I'm not altering per se. If I'm on the muscle, I'm not altering the position of the bones, which are going to, again, before set up that muscle to be able to do what it needs to do. So it does give you, like I said, it may neurologically shut things down a little bit so you can relax a little bit. Um, you're feeling a safety. Uh, you may move some fluid around to help uh, move like the muscle tissues around. To help create some space to kind of let you move into that area temporarily. But we have to, again, address the bony position, the joint positions to actually set up where we're going to have that position. And again, everything starts from the inside, right? So we start from internally and then we slowly move out, right? We slowly run out of space the further we go away. And then we have to take it back as we come back in, right? And so we have to have that understanding of that foam roller is going to be a temporary feel good solution, move some fluid around if you're doing it on the muscles. Now, you know, massage therapy feels good, um, joint manipulation, pressures, things like that. So like lifting weights, all lifting weights and exercises and breathing, all the things, they're altering joint positions. We're putting pressure in the joints, putting pressure on the bones, I should say, putting pressure on the bones, making them move in certain areas, right? So if we have a uh, foam roller or something like that, we can place it like on our rib cage. We can place it on our, uh, on the bony parts. It's uncomfortable usually. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie about that. But essentially now I'm trying to address the bony position. So I'm going to position my body potentially in an area that I want. So mm. let's say I want to get uh, internal rotation, or, you know, internal rotation of the hip, right? Mm. In order to do that or adduction of the hip, I need to have this go on. I need this to come this way. Yes. Okay. So I may lay on something and it's going to, I'm going to put mm -hmm. my position, my body in a position that is biased towards that. So I'm relaxing the tissues that are pulling it into this mm. external rotated position, the hip being here, if I'm trying to get it here. So we have everything attached here. So this, these are tight. It's going to pull it this way, right? And so if I'm here and it's going to keep it tight, it's going to keep it tight. So I'm trying to loosen tissues up, put them in position that are they're relaxed. And then I'm going to hmm. lay on that foam roller or whatever it is. And it's going to move it in that direction. Now it's adjusting that. This position here is now is going to trickle down effect all the other tissues, Yeah. right? It's going to position me in better positions. Now this is temporary too. Hmm. but it's going to be a you're end up picking up way more motion doing this than just on the muscle because now instead yeah. of affecting it band right i'm affecting everything down the chain so now i'm affecting all the muscles all the stuff down the chain that starts here right and then from there i can move into an exercise that's going to help me keep that position so i don't feel tight in those positions anymore 
treat, re, again, remodeling those tissues, remodeling uh, the stuff to be able to hold that position. Same thing, massage guns, same idea, uh, massage certain areas. You can use it more neurologically as well with a uh, turning it really high, making it uncomfortable, hitting on muscles that aren't very good at firing. And you can kind of shake the muscle up to make it, to drive some changes. Uh, that's a little bit more complicated. Um, but I would say like a foam roller is a simple way to use on muscles or on uh, joints or bones rather than just on muscle. Again, nothing wrong with using the muscle but understanding that's gonna be a temporary window into mm -hmm. opportunity versus an actual fix, which is why, you know, people have been foam rolling their IT bands or the quads for, you know, 10 years and they're still tight, right? Like it's just, they're not going to, uh, it's not going to fix anything at all. Mm -hmm. True. You, you, you have an interesting uh, Instagram post where you talked about the detriments of uh, moving too much or moving too little. Yes. So if you could go over that. So people. So I, I think it's more of, so moving too little, mm. eh, moving too much. Yeah, we should we say moving too much? And I would say moving too much in the same thing. So it's like, I was, I was, I was more representing like lifting weights, right? So we say bodybuilders, yeah. powerlifters, things like that. Yes. And yes. then, yes. and I like them, I compared them to being sedentary, right? And so essentially what this is, is it were either one is going to be biasing one, our position into one spot. So we're, if we're constantly doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, we're going to bias our positions. But overall, what we're looking at now is we're looking at more of how the system is utilized. So if I'm standing still and I'm just sitting here hmm. over time, I'm not moving. Like I stop producing, like my muscles shrink potentially. I don't, you know, I don't get, uh, I lose muscle mass. I start being favored towards what we'll consider the large muscle unit. Mm -hmm. So we have, when our muscles fire, they can fire a bunch of muscles at the same time or like one or two at the same time, right? And the goal would be to have muscles strong enough where you can do one or two at a time to move yourself through motions when you don't have weight. But if you're very sedentary and we're just sitting here, what we end up having is we start getting our muscles aren't strong enough, if you will, um, and they have to use the big most mu muscles. Like we had to fire a bunch of muscles at once just to lift my arm up. What that does is it increases the rate of force on the tissue. So now it's like, I have a hard time with relative motion because I don't have enough strength you know, to do relative motion. I have, to, I have to do large muscle units and it's going to essentially lock everything up as I go to move. This leads to poor energy, stiffer tissues as well because now I start relying more on the, on the tissues to do the motion. So it's like, I don't move, I don't stress them out. They just get thick. And then next you know, it's like everything's really stiff and I don't move very well. Hmm. Or vice versa, if you're lifting a lot of weights, super heavy, same idea. If I'm just constantly doing heavy weights, constantly doing the same thing, I start biasing these motions. I start relying on potentially type two. I don't know how to relax, right? I essentially lift heavy weights. Now the tissues get super thick because I constantly push this weight on me because I'm constantly under this load, under the stress that now I have this constantly thick tissue. And so now as I go to move one, now I'm almost too strong, right? I said to put it simply, where my tissues are so strong that my body weight or my, my strength internally isn't enough to deform the connective tissues themselves. And so now as I go to move, I can't get a expansion. I can't get a stretch mm -hmm. because it's too thick, right? Two, I have the, I'm relying again on big motor units because I never do like a, controlled motion, everything's fast, everything's hard, everything's just really quick motion. So I don't train, I don't teach my body essentially how to use the smaller motions. I don't know, teach myself how to do more fine movements, right? And so now I have a connective tissue change in both, very similar thickening of it to, um, I go to move, I just have a general compression overall of the system because everything's just so bogged down. And that's either from me sitting around too long and not stressing it enough, or maybe putting so much stress on the body, it has to add this extra tissue, utilize these different strategies to protect itself. And so both are going to lead to similar loss of motion, mm. which can lead to similar uh, you know, respiratory rates, things like that. Obviously, you err on the side of doing too much, right? I'd rather have you do too much usually than too little because uh, there's other things you're working with uh, from that standpoint. Again, we talk about biopsychosocial, you working out is going to affect those other stressors a lot more mm. than just sitting down and not doing anything. You, you sit down, uh, you don't do anything, you lose your rotational capabilities. But then you do a lot of heavy bilateral lifting mm -hmm. that will also, these big muscles, chest, lats, and everything, which like it will compress the ribcage front to back. It will mm -hmm. also still relative motion. 
Yep. Yeah. So like, if you put it that way, hundred percent, if I sit here all the time, I don't do anything. Gravity constantly is on me. So I get, I get smushed from gravity constantly. If I'm lifting weights all the time, I'm getting smushed by my muscles constantly. Mm, yeah. So it's the same idea. Yeah. You get this compression overall mm. and I lose my ability to get relative right. motion yeah. slash rotate. Uh, so this is something that I wanted to discuss with you. It's regarding kids. Yeah. You know, the adults are very sedentary. It's universal everywhere. Adults yep. are sedentary. But kids these days, they are given a tablet, phone, computer, laptop, whatever, so that they remain silent. They don't create a mess and parents can be busy. But that in a way is disrupting the growth in them, like the physical as well as mental and every other thing. Included. Yep. They, don't, they don't go out to play as much like they're happy with Xbox, PlayStation, or other games. Uh, so they don't go out, play much, don't do variety of movements. And that can be pretty detrimental in the long run. So if, if you work with kids, you know how the scene is. So if you could mm -hmm. talk about that thing. Yeah, without a doubt. So like kids are malleable, right? They're, they're constantly growing, right? They're not fixed anymore. Like when you're an adult, you're almost fixed. You know, mm -hmm. like you're there, you're there, you are what you are, you know, it's, you know, we're always can make changes, but you know, for the most part, you know, we're not growing another six inches, right? Mm -hmm. We just don't have the stuff in us to do so. Odds are it's gravity and a bunch of other stuff. But um, when it comes to kids, they're still growing. So everything's soft on them, right? Everything can move, everything can remodel. But at the same time, if we think about a baby from the time it's born, the time it's walking, right? Mm -hmm. It's constantly learning, constantly trying things, constantly figuring things out. And so it's learning how to do these things and so, and, but it's through motion, it's through movement, it's through activity, constantly, constantly, constantly doing different things to figure it out. And then it finds out which way to work. And then as you increase load, as it increases weight, as it increases things, it has to figure out the strategy constantly because it's constantly changing. Things are constantly out of whack with kids, right? Bones don't grow the same length all the time, you know, so you're constantly having this up and down. So their body's constantly having to figure things out. When they get sedentary, we decrease that practice time, hmm. right? So we're decreasing that practice time. They're on the phones all the time. They're sitting down. They get good at sitting. So the body's like, hey, we sit here. Let's, let's build things up so we don't get, you know, with, with our butt, you know, whatever it is. We don't want our guts to fall out from our backside. We don't want our, um, we don't want to get rug burns. We don't want to break the bone there. So let's get things there. Let's put things there. Let's get it real tight there, right? And so your body, you're teaching your body at this point, one, to protect itself from the in that position, get good in that position, be able to handle that position for a long period of time. And then vice versa, you're decreasing its ability to practice walking, decreasing its ability to figure movements out, decreasing its ability to, hey, look, I can utilize all these different muscles or muscle patterns or motor units to move versus I'm gonna use these two because I'm not good at it. So then they get patterned into these positions, right? They get patterned to drive these, uh, these movements, right? But the thing is when you're young, the issue is at the same time, because we're growing and we're constantly putting things, we have the ability to create as again, I'm going to go back to this connective tissue stuff again, this, uh, this tissue to add to that, to increase the amount of cells that are in there, right? And so it's thickness, it's ability to do force, but there's a window for that. When you get older, you kind of lose that, uh, you lose that window. Ah. And so having kids stop down, like now they have a decrease in essentially their ability for their tendons and their muscles and things to handle stress overall because you've addressed, you haven't done it enough. And so now they're, they're essentially they're requiring certain positions. So like you say, you see a lot of the kids now, like the duck feet turn way oh, up. Oh yes. Feet turn up. Yeah. 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 They kind of waddle. Mm. Like it's, that's a lot of from sitting down, sitting cross leg, um, you know, in the, yeah, sitting cross leg, sitting down, it's going to drive these positions. And it's like, we need, we're going to get good at this position. We're going to, again, we shorten it up. It's going to, those muscles are going to fill up to take up that space. And then they get good at it. Then they get good at it. So then they go stand up like their bones literally are bent in these positions, right? Cause they're malleable. They're constantly growing. So you have these bones shaped into these crazy positions, right? So we say that's here, that's there, then that literally folded in, right? Mm -hmm. If we look at that now, so now we have this bend in the bone, legit, like a, a bend in this bone because we're still growing, imagine we're still growing. So now we have the muscle that, you know, we're pretty similar as people, um, as humans, where things attach, right? So we say there's a muscle attached from here to here. And if we say we don't like slack, right? When I go in here, you know, that's going to take slack. So therefore I'm going to fill that muscle up. 
But imagine if that bent over towards that. So now I have motion up here potentially, but now this is still bent over here. So this still stays nice and tight, all right? Or I can't get over there because it's so close, it's even more tight. So now you have these bony changes now, which are altering what we'll consider normal movement or normal positions in these kids. And so if they don't, the thing is when they're young, there's time to fix it, right? They're still growing, they're still changing. There's a, they're, they're very malleable at that point. You can put them in position, have them do a lot of things and their body's gonna figure it out. As long as they're doing it and you force them to do, or you have them do these things, like play on a playground, just do things that are going to challenge their ability to perform the task, right? But if you don't do it and they're stuck on their phone, they're stuck on looking at iPhone, they're stuck sitting down, stuck being sedentary, as they get older, they're pretty much stuck in that position. It'll be very, mm -hmm. very difficult to make these changes. I'm not saying it's impossible. Uh, what I'm saying is it's, it's hard, very, very hard to the point where most people aren't going to worry about it. But then that's going to bias their ability to perform certain tasks overall. Does it say they're going to get hurt? Not necessarily. But we also have to understand that these positions, if we go deeper, are going to affect the organs. And as I talk about the organ positions, all that stuff is going to matter now, right? So now it's going to affect everything, not just the movement, but the entire, like all your subsystems, everything, how you breathe, how you move, how you think, how you, uh, how you digest foods, all these things are going to come into play because now if I'm stuck in this slew foot turned out position, I'm going to be biased to doing things a certain way. I'm going to lose the ability to fill certain areas inside of me. And so therefore, like I'm going to lose, like, you know, so let's say part of my digestive tract, I'm going to use part of these things that I could use, but because they're so compressed, or so adapted to this position, we don't have it functioning as we were designed to function, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And so that's where it's like with kids, the big thing with them is they're super moldable. Have them do things. You know, they have to get out there. They have to practice. They have to, you know, get their body moving. They have to do these things. Like if you don't get them to do something, odds are they're going to be stuck there. And then that's going to lead to things down the line, if that makes sense. And like, say, I feel like as a parent and as a, a guardian or uncle, whatever you want, it's almost your response. They don't know. You know, they're not thinking about that. No, they it's don't know. Yeah. To get them out there and do it. Even if they don't want to, just, hey, look, you got to, even, hey, look, if you're on the iPad, you got to go for a walk, right? You got to go upstairs. You got to go in here. Like, just go do something. Like, mm. go crawl on the floor. You got to be on all four. You can't quit sitting down. Like, land your side, land your other side. Like, it's constantly, you have to be on them, right? But again, the best thing is going to be activity. Best thing is going to be that variability of constantly moving, changing things over time as they as they grow. So the more you can get them outside, the more they're getting playing, the better option. And again, you can't have them do set exercises like, hey, I'm gonna have you do a split squat. Or I'm gonna have you do a, a breathing exercise. I'm like, they're not gonna do that. Like they won't understand how to do it either, but they can walk, they can go play in the playground, right? They can do that, they can lift their knees high, right? Hey, lift your knees high, you know, lean on the wall, you know, lay, pull your knee to your chest, but keep your leg on the wall, you know, little things like that can help drive these changes within kids. Um, and then they, they change fairly quickly too because they are so moldable, right? They can create decently changes as long as they stay focused and as long as they do things. True, man. Um, because I have seen personally. So when I go out for my morning walks, I see kids playing and I feel so happy for them that they're moving. But I know kids who have been handed over tablets, iPhones, whatever, uh, during their growing years. And this is how they sit. Mm -hmm. Slouch like crazy. All the guts settle mm. down, on, mm -hmm. the chair, down the on the chair. Yeah. They walk like this. Yep, side to side because they can't. They cannot they ro can't, rotate. They can't do these things moving. Yeah. Right? So they can't do that. And it's like they have to rely on tip, stiff because they can't, they can't do this. So they have to shift the whole weight over. Mm. Get it down the ground. Whole weight over. Whole weight over. Swing, swing, swing. And, and they, like you can't, you're not fast doing that, right? Mm. That's slow. That's real slow. You know, this is fast. This not so fast. Hmm. You know, this gives me a lot of things to use to get strength in, right? Sitting over here, I'm not very strong here, right? The weight's over this way, you know, it's not underneath me. I'm kind of like falling essentially. And it's like, and it's rapid hmm. one spot over and over again, right? Now, again, as they, as kids, they're not going to have much pain because they're yes. so malleable. They heal constantly, constantly healing. But now they're healing in those areas, right? And so they have this constant remodeling in those areas so I, so those areas get really thick those areas get really used or overstretched in certain areas and now when they go to do something when they get older when they don't heal as fast uh you start having issues mm -hmm. it's when they get older less malleable less changes can be made window of opportunity is much 
lesser, mm-hmm. that's when issues come. And- 100%. Like, you, I mean, you notice when you're young. I mean, you may, but they're subtle, right? You may notice what the kids, the issues with, oh, they're allergies. Oh, mm-hmm. all of a sudden they got allergies. Or, oh, he can't eat, the, he can't tolerate this food. Or, you know, his jaw's looking funny. Or mm-hmm. his nose is starting to change shape. Or, you know, his ears are going one way. And, that, you know, so like you start seeing these things subtly, mm-hmm. but you don't, you know, it, it's, 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 and it's due to the sedentariness, right? It's due to all these things. But because most people don't notice that or don't realize how everything affects everything, mm-hmm. they don't even relate it. You know, like, oh, he doesn't breathe well. Or, hey, he grinds his teeth. Or, mm-hmm. you know, his, you know, he's getting crazy crooked teeth. Or why is his shoulder so high? You know, mm-hmm. why can't he think? Why is he always crying? Why is he always stressed out? And all these things come into this overall, we look at, again, go back to the biosocial social conversation of how they all feed into each other and how this position can bias you in these certain exactly. things, things overall. It's crazy how, it all, it's how it's all linked. All linked, man. All linked. It's all connected. Mm-hmm. <laughs> crazy. We, we were also talking about uh, like cancer, autoimmune disorders and everything. And we were talking about our viewpoints regarding how space in the body relates to unexplained diseases. Yeah. So let's talk about this. We, we talked about that a little bit earlier when I was talking about the guts and how mm-hmm. it played a role, right? And so again, my whole, my whole thought process, uh, I'll reiterate that again, is again, this is 100% theory. Um, mm-hmm. Please don't like, oh, this is it. This is the reason, this is it. Uh, this, this is one theory on how we have, I think how we play into um, some of these chronic diseases. And, um, and this is a very, very general, general view of it right you have to know you know again your scientists your doctors things like that they should know these things like all the way down to like hey look you know cancer is metastasized or whatever it is it's un- you know an uncontrolled growth of cells right and so like yeah that happens right but why we you know we don't know we don't know you know could be this could be that like and so i think overall in general i, I think again cancer is like a last stitch effort to to make a change and so it's like we're trying to change we're trying to grow we're trying to fill up space or we're trying to create some space one or the other so if we have a liver and we have this constant pressure on the liver through alcohol use the constant blood for like more you know it, it needs oh we need more um we need more of the the the, the working units of the liver they put a simple because we need to process more alcohol right we need to process it more cirrhosis same idea right we need mm-hmm. to process more but it's trying it's trying it's trying or like the, the pressure so high it, it, it is too much stress on it right as mentioned before everything kind of has this connective tissue on it and things like that if i'm constantly poking it i'm going to remodel to protect myself right mm-hmm. and so like the same idea when it comes to like things like that is coming to this constant pressure on it now leads it to get stiff mm-hmm. right to protect itself or constant pressure is too high too long we get too much expansion so if let's say we have an area and we're constantly in this extended position or constantly have this constant pressure from our diaphragm on our organs, pushing us in one way. And then within there, we have things trying to go through. We have processes trying to occur within your organs. But because of the increased blood flow or decreased blood flow or this lack of pressure to help things move along or this lack of pressure to slow things down or whatever it is, it's going to remodel, try to make a change. But the issue is because now we've created this space that's not necessarily there, or we have this change occur that's signaled by a certain, you know, enzyme or, uh, or, or cell or, or, you know, some catalyst that's involved, it starts to grow out of control because now we don't have a check for it. There's no check. It just constantly keeps growing and growing and growing. There's nothing to tell to shut off because we're constantly in this position that tells us we need more. We need more. We need more. The issue is we don't need more, right? We just need to adjust because they're useless now, right? But because of this false sense of pressure or lack thereof, it sinks it needs more or mm-hmm. less of something, right? And so now we have this constant growth. And so overall adjusting, balancing how we have these pressures, you know, this movement, this constant give and take of flow within our system, you know, I think can help with decreasing these things. Now I say this and I don't mean just through um, movement, right? It's not just movement that creates these pressures, right? If I'm, I mean, for alcohol, if I'm constantly intaking something or constantly bringing something in, I can have these pressure changes based on the function of the unit, right? Um, of what of what we do, right? If I'm constantly taking in, you know, have if I'm constantly dehydrated or whatever it is, um, like kidneys need a certain flow through there or whatever it is, that you know, it's going to be a, a ton of pressure or lack thereof within the kidney and eventually it's going to try to remodel. Next, you know, you have kidney disease because you have this issue or you have a constant 
poison coming through your body and because of how you eat or how you, whatever you're doing and uh, be fatty, too fatty, you know, too much fat going through, you know, all these other things, poor blood flow overall, you have these different changes and it's either too much pressure, too little, and then the body adjusts. And, and then the issue is either shuts down, creates these protection barriers, or it tries to rebuild itself. And the problem is it rebuilds out of control. And so adjusting overall movement, things like that, bearing, you know, again, the pressure can come from, from position. Um, I think a lot of them come from position, um, but at the same time, a lot of them come from, I believe how we, you know, a lot of nutri nutri nutritional intake and, and, and the poor, poor nutritional intake. But again, you know, everything feeds into everything, in my opinion, like it just, it's just not just that it's going to be multifactorial, but I believe it's the idea of like, if I'm in certain positions or driving certain things, it's going to affect how those organs work. And we get to a point where it's too far gone and the body's making a last ditch effort to make a change. And then you actually know you have these issues. And again, you could be born congenitally with a, a DNA, a cell missing or a enzyme missing or, you know, gene missing. I should say that was the word I was looking for, a gene that buys you towards the impossibility of creating the pressure or expansion that you need within the system from a, on a physiological level, right? But overall, I honestly believe like, I, I really think that has a big role in it. And, I, and again, adjusting your body, constantly moving, increasing the options that your body has to do things through movement and things like that, I think can help that. Not to say movement is going to cure cancer or anything along those lines, or it's going to prevent you from getting cancer. Um, it's just the idea of creating help throughout the system some way, shape or form. But again, some, some things are, you know, I don't know, you know, very much. I don't know. Um, I'm not an oncologist. I'm, I'm not a cancer researcher. It just feels like uh, a lot of these, a lot of these, again, I'm just not, not just cancer, but a lot of these chronic diseases are just due to lack of variability overall. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, and that can come from super down all the way down to the microbiological level or all the way up to this, hey, look, let's get you moving better. So you don't get these, uh, some of these chronic uh, respiratory issues or some of these chronic, um, you know, internal stuff, especially gut issues, I think, I think moving big on gut, mm -hmm. uh, gut issues, things like that. Rectal dysfunction, you know, things along those lines. It's so true. Having variability is something which is so crucial, emotional, physical, both. We need variability in both sides. Everything, everything. Yep. All, all aspects. You need to be able to turn it on. You need to turn it off. Yeah. Like, cause there, there are aspects in life where you need less, you need more. Mm. You know? You need to have fluctuations. You don't want to be even kills cool and all potentially, but eventually that, that leads to problems. Yeah. Awesome, Greg. That was incredible talking to you. Learned a lot. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the viewers are going to learn a lot wow. as well. So Appreciate a lot, it. Lot, lots of myth busting discussion <laughs> <laughs> happening. Yeah, you know what I'm saying it's just trying to explain, you know, try to explain things that make sense. And in yes. my opinion, I look at it. Why does this work? You know, it's not. I'm not trying to poo-poo it. Just why does it work and where, where would it be useful? Mm. The, the time and context for everything. Everything, everything. Yeah. It can be exhausting thinking about it, but it, it, it leads to much better decision-making. Yeah, exactly. Much, much greater success, yeah. Like you said, insanity is doing the same stuff over and over again and expecting something will happen. Yeah, it's expecting a different result, right? So. Exactly. Awesome, man. Great uh, catching up with you and we will catch up soon someday. Yeah, definitely. I yeah, appreciate you having me on. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. I hope you liked this episode. And if you did, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And I'll be coming up with such exciting episodes in the future as well. Thank you.